chapter of John. We're going to be starting in verse number 43. But before we begin there, I'd like one more time to ask a word of prayer real quick. So if you would bow your heads. Father God, we come before you this morning humbled and yet excited, God. Anytime that we get to worship and fellowship and worship you together as one community, God, it's such a blessing. And I ask right now that you would keep all eyes and hearts and ears attentive to your word, God. Don't let me speak, but speak through me and let everyone understand that I have no authority but what is given to me by you. And just let your words ring forth. Give us a great day in worship, a great day in fellowship, and give us a great safe day as we make our ways home after this service. We love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. So before we get into the scripture, I have a, a few questions for you. Number one, what is the significance of the miracles that Jesus Christ performed throughout his earthly mission? With that in mind, how have those miracles that you've witnessed throughout life impacted your faith? Everybody knows we've all seen miracles. We've had times where we've seen people that were very sick, that were on the verge of death, much like the little Lorelei. And we've seen God step up when we pray. And we've seen the miraculous healings he's done. So how's that impacted your faith? And what role do they play in your walk with Christ? I want to remind each and every one of you that the relationship we have with Jesus is an ever ongoing eternal relationship. And every day on that walk, we should be aiming to be closer to Jesus, closer to God the Father. But also, I want you to think about this. What about Jesus' wisdom and his sense of timing? How do these things affect your day-to-day -day living? Uh, I'll give you a real quick story on God's timing because it, it kind of seems appropriate when you think about getting beaten and bashed. As y'all know who, who are here, we're in my truck today because my wife's car blew up on me. I spent about three and a half to four hours working on it this past week. Was all excited. I thought I had it fixed, started it up, and come to find out that it's gone for good. It's pretty much headed to that grave for parking in the sky for fours. I was very, very defeated. I was frustrated. And I talked to God, and God showed me that I had a bigger blessing because we have another vehicle that does need some work, but it looks like it's in 10 times better shape. And we've had that vehicle, and God's kind of let me be lackadaisical, a little lazy. But now when the need has come, once again, Christ is right there. God is right there answering that need. It was his sense of timing that makes all this possible. And that's important. So today we're going to dive in. We're going to focus on what the scripture says about miracles and more importantly about God's wisdom and his knowledge. We're going to be looking in John. So if you have your Bible open, if you don't mind, uh, let everybody stand for the reading of God's word. Starting, like I said, in verse 43 of the fourth chapter. After two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine, and at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them, the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. 
and he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. So, go ahead and be seated. The first point, we're going to have three main points today. The very first point is this. Jesus presents himself at the right place and at the right time. This is tough because in life we, we, we all have challenges. We have day-to-day -day grinds. And this world will wear on you. And why will this world wear on you? Well, number one, because you're a sinner. And you walk in a world of other sinners. And you're all trying to make your way that daily grind. Trials will come. They frustrate you. But Jesus, though he's there all the time, he specifically shows up at the right place and the right time. The first thing you see, verses 43 through 45, is pretty much a dialogue to introduce us. 46 through 54 is the heart of this message and the most important. But we see that Jesus returned to Galilee from Jerusalem, seeking those hearts who were not hardened and who were willing to receive them. Everybody knows that Jerusalem was God's chosen people. Jerusalem, these are the people that should have been excited to hear the word of Jesus. They should have been open to the word of Jesus. But we also know that their hearts were hardened, that they had made lives that were focused around tradition. They were focused around legalism and laws. And like so many people today, they wanted to earn their merit. They wanted to earn their salvation. They wanted to show their God that they were good enough that they would meet the qualifications. And so they largely overlooked Jesus. Jesus was a very smart, very discerning man this time on earth. Of course he was, because what is he? Fully God, fully human. And in his discernment, Jesus was not going to waste his time with people who would not hear. So, why is this important? Well, it's important because we need to keep in mind that the Word of God never goes out void. And the Holy Spirit's prompting us to witness cannot be avoided for fear of rejection. Now, what do I mean when I, when I say why that's important here? Jesus went where he knew people would receive him. The world did not think this way. He went to places where they believed were outcasts. You remember, we just got done studying with the woman of the well. And what did she tell him? She goes, why would you come to me? It doesn't make sense. Each and every one of you who have given your heart to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior have a calling on your life. You are called to disciple. You are called to lead people. You're called to tell people the good news. But so many times we do what the Pharisees, what the people of Israel did. We cast judgment. This is a person that will listen, but this person will not. It doesn't work that way, guys. God gives his message to each and every soul who's ever walked the face of this earth. There is no separation. There is no picking. The difference is, is God knows who will come, and we do not. And so you can not be afraid to judge or afraid to witness, or you cannot simply decide that this person is worth it or this person is not. That's dangerous. Now, another point going a little earlier is this Jesus lamented the hard hearted condition of his own people, and he testified the ancient proverb. This was an ancient, ancient proverb, but a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. This reveals two problems. Number one, it reveals the problems with the people of Jerusalem. The fact that they were not worshiping God, they were worshiping a routine. They were worshiping traditions they had always known. The God they were worshiping was largely a God that they had made up. They had made their own rules on how to serve God. The overwhelming majority of the rules that they had were rules that God had not set forth. They had. It also reveals why Jesus chose to depart to Galilee. In Sunday school this morning, one of the things that we talked about 
was faith and how faith has to be received. Faith when put into practice, you do not have faith because you just decided to make a choice. You have faith because God knew you would listen. God brought conviction through the Holy Spirit. And through that conviction, God gave you faith to put into practice. Jesus knew these things, guys. He knew that these Galileans were looking. He knew that these Galileans would pay attention. So, in other words, have you ever heard the, the phrase, I know each and every one of you have, do not cast your pearls before swine. You're to witness openly with everybody. You're to love openly, share the good news of the gospel with everybody. But don't sit there and continuously share over and over again to a hard heart who doesn't listen. God's word doesn't go out void. God doesn't tell you that you're going to see the results. He just tells you to be a doer. Plant the word. Leave the rest up to him. So moving to the meat of our message, looking forward to verse 46, we see that Jesus performs a healing far beyond the mere miracles that we see. So many times we look at the healing of those we love that we pray for. We see the job that was provided for a family that's been in need. And we're like, praise God, that's a miracle. And it is. But we miss the real miracle. We miss the big miracle. So the first thing you see in verse 40, I mean, uh, in verse 46, what does it say? It says, oh, wait a minute. Got to get my page right. Sorry about that. So he came again to Cana and Galilee where he had made the water wine. And uh, there was a, at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So a couple things. First thing is... Upon his return to Cana, to the place where he performed his first sign, we know what that first sign is, turning the water into wine. But when he comes there, he's immediately approached by a royal official of the court of Herod and Tepes concerning his son who is gravely ill. Now, the Bible doesn't say it, but it's implied. This Roman, when he comes, he's imploring Jesus, heal my son. My son is at the point of death. When you look at that, it's crucial that we realize Christ's divine power and authority is received by people of all types, especially those who would not be willing to receive. This was a nobleman. This was a man who was very highly thought of and respected, and more importantly, this was a Roman. This is a Roman official of him that, that comes. This is somebody that on the surface looks like the last person that would ever trust in Jesus. Remember, the Romans did not like Jesus. But yet, he comes. There's a lot of people in this world that we would never expect. When you get to heaven, you're going to be very surprised at who's there. And I think you're going to be a little more surprised at who's not. That's right. Right. There's a lot of people that proclaim Jesus. There's a lot of people that proclaim the gospel. But when you listen to it, it's hollow. It's phony. It's a fraud. Then there's a lot of people who look. They may be a little different. They may be a little rock and roll. They may be a little on the edge. But when you get to the heart of that person, they're on fire. They live for Jesus. So in witnessing, you cannot practice judgment. It's important to understand that we don't know who's really open to serving Jesus and who's not. That's why we're called to be farmers and to plant the seed and let Jesus yield the crop. Looking at verse 48, you see Jesus immediately challenges the man's motives in seeking the healing of his son. Verse 48 says this, So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs, and wonders, you will not believe. The, the man, his, his heart was real when he come to Jesus, but he come knowing what Jesus had already done. There was tales 
of the many miracles. We know scripture tells us time and time again, even his own disciples kept telling him, show us so that we can see and believe. And Jesus is in turn telling them, you stiff necked people, how many times must I show you? This challenge reveals the true nature of the official's heart and his motives in seeking healing for his son. Jesus gets to the real point here. He wanted a worldly motivation. Now, don't get me wrong, he loved his son. And that's great. We love our family members when we pray for them, when we lift them up. But that's not enough. What good is the healing if the healing lasts another 10, 30, 40 years? But they spend eternity in separation from God. Think about that. That's where Jesus is calling him here. He's saying, hey, you're missing the point. You keep on seeking miracles, but you do not believe. And then, look ahead. The official's response is one of urgency and sincerity. Verse 49 says this. It says, the official said to him, Sir, come down before my son dies. So the nobleman is pleasing with Jesus, or pleading, not pleasing, I'm sorry, pleading with Jesus. He is begging Jesus, giving him the title, sir. That little word, that one three-letter word, sir, is the most important part of it. Because in that moment, he is reflecting a beautiful respect for Jesus. The nobleman is placing himself under Jesus' authority. That's the same thing that we're called to do. Understand something. I'm up here preaching to you, but I am nobody. I'm just another person. It's about Jesus. And that's what this nobleman, that's what he does. It's obvious that the father was very concerned for his life, the son's life, that is. But this sir, this placing himself under Jesus' authority, it's also more important that he believed that Jesus alone could save his son. Jesus confronts him, and basically what Jesus tells him, this is a heart matter. This is not about seeing miracles. This is about putting faith in me and believing I can. The nobleman's response was just that. So, you see in response that Jesus does what? He heals the son and the nobleman in one distinct act. In verse 50, Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed that Jesus, or what Jesus spoke to him and went his own way. So, he commands the official, go, your son lives. The father believes and went his own way back to his home. This right here was an incredible act of faith. As soon as that response, as soon as Jesus says, go, your son lives, he's healed. Now, the man does not know that. The nobleman, he doesn't know that. Not for physical. He hasn't been able to see that. But he accepts what Jesus says and puts on the act of faith in choosing to believe that. That's an incredible act of faith. How many times do we see things in our life, in our day-to-day -day walk, where God is telling you, Jesus is telling you, go, it is okay. I have taken care of this for you. And how many times do we still stumble away under the burden of trying to fix things ourselves, even after we've given it to Christ? Have you ever done that? Have you ever been at church on a Sunday morning or maybe at your home? You fall down, you throw all your burdens at the feet of Jesus. Every last one. You're bawling, crying. You feel such peace. But you get up and you're burdened. And the reason you're burdened is because the first thing you did when you got up was you grabbed all that all that heartache, all that trial that you went through that you just laid at the feet of Jesus, you grab it and take it away from him and try to convince it yourself anyway. This act of faith and believing what Jesus had said, when he took Jesus at his word, it reveals that Christ has done healing work in his heart as well. This is spiritual healing. Christ had given him the reason to have faith and giving him faith and this man in turn puts that faith in practice. 
There's the miracle. There's the real miracle. Because the son is healed. Yay, praise God. Let's have a party. Angels in heaven were singing and dancing because a man's heart was turned to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Lived. Salvation, regeneration happened with this act. And this brings me to the third point. This is important, guys. The confirmation of the healing of the royal official's son resulted in the spiritual healing of his entire household. So let's sum it up like this. Confirmation of Christ's work in your life should, and when, when you do submit to the Holy Spirit, not even should, it results in spiritual healing. You see that confirmation. If you're saved, it usually results in a revival of fire. You come back to Christ, you get excited. It results in spreading the fire of God because when somebody sees you excited, they get excited. I don't know about you, but this gets me excited. This was a man who, through trying to save his son's life, saved him. His life, his son's life, and his entire household's life. And let me rephrase. He does it, but Christ does. You talk about revival. If y'all heard me talk, you know I say revival starts where? In the heart of man. We always pray for mass revival, but you can't have mass revival if it doesn't start in your own heart. That's what you saw right there. Verse 51 Shows us this. Upon returning to his home, the father was met with his servants, informing him that his son was recovering. Now, this is important. And why is this important? Because the coming to the father, or the servants, the coming to him to inform him gives a, a weight, a gravity, so to speak, to the condition of his son before the healing. This was great. This young man was right there. His last day was coming. They were so overwhelmed and floored by his healing. They wanted to meet their master, this noble, and inform him of the good news. That's important because if it was that serious to them, imagine how serious it was to the father. When you look at that, imagine how serious it was to God. The father comes in and he questions him. We see that. What's verse 52 say? It says, So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. The father's question of when his son began to recover, however, revealed the miraculous healing that was performed by Jesus. As soon as they told him his child's getting better, and he asked, and they told him yesterday, the seventh day, right then, light bulb, he knew. And we see that move into the next verse in verse 53. The father remembered the words Jesus said, your son lives. And he knew that Jesus was responsible for his healing. And he believed in Jesus from that day forward. He and all his household. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. There's your miracle. Jesus recalls, or not Jesus, I'm sorry, but uh, this nobleman, he recalls that Jesus said, go, your son lives. He recalls his act of faith, and he knows that his act of faith was not in vain. He knows that Jesus brought life. Jesus brought a new life, a life unto this man, a life unto this father, and a new life unto all his household. They all believed. If you think that God doesn't work major miracles, live out your faith. Live out your joy that you have for Jesus. And others will take note. Others will see. Others will want. And others will believe. That's how you start revival. That's how you start a world that says, I want more of God. I want Jesus. Something that's interesting about this, 
The phrase your son lives is repeated, what, three times in this passage. This phrase rings out as a joyous refrain of a resurrection hymn. It's going over and over again. Your son lives three times. Isn't that interesting? Three times. Let's think. How many legs are there at the Trinity? Three. How many days did Jesus spend in the grave? Three. On the third day, he rose again. On the third day, your new life was made possible. I don't know about y'all, but that is absolutely beautiful. It's encouraging and it is exciting. Yes. Do you not understand the real miracles? And if Jesus was performing miracles then, do you think he's not performing them today? Right. Let me tell you, I can tell you a big miracle right now. I see multiple faces sitting before me in this room, hearing the word of God, singing praises and worshiping. That is a miracle. I saw a moment where we all shared prayers, needed prayers. That is a miracle. Because the real miracle involved with life is the Holy Spirit's conviction, the Son's sacrificial love that paves the way, and God the Father's provision of it all to bring you back to Him in a relationship to make it right. The, the last point of this is this would be the second sign of Jesus in Galilee. Very simple. There was a lot of miracles he did, but this was specific. This was a sign. So that's two you see, and there's more coming. But in closing, let me implore you not to miss the main focal point, and that's very simple. This passage is not about the healing of the official son. That's the surface. That's the hook. This is about the healing of the heart, along with the heart of his son, his entire household. That miraculous healing of his son is beautiful. The healing of that little angel, Lorelai, that's beautiful. The healing that Pat and Ken watched when Becky made her recovery, that's beautiful. But it's where it left me. That's the real healing. Hearts on fire for their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Spiritual regeneration. His physical healing is a beautiful thing to witness. But salvation is so much more. So much better. That's the miracle that we want to see. So I'm going to leave you with these final few questions as the praise and worship team comes. Do you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior? If not, do you want to? Do you need to call out to Jesus? Whatever that need may be, this altar is open. So let us pray.